So this is the third year we've done this. Yep. And, uh, and as Luke said, the first year, I think, that evening, you, you got engaged. I did. I was very surprised, but yes. <laughs> uh, and Zach is here. I saw him earlier today. And then uh, last year, you didn't get married at La Web, but you got married at some point, and then... Two or three days later, yeah. And you're still married, so everything, <laughs> still, yeah. So. yeah, coming up on our first year anniversary. Um, and I've been able to interview you each year, which is great. We've had our ups and downs, uh, a lot of ups, a few downs. Search Wiki, you may remember, <laughs> but, um, I think we fixed it now for you, though. <laughs> we finally killed it. But every year, like, there's interesting things going on. And with you in particular, you now have a new job. Uh, you were in charge of search and user experience, and now your job is... Uh, well, we're calling it consumer products broadly, but it's focused on both product management and engineering for local and geo efforts. So this means things like local search, maps, earth, Street View, Google Latitude, uh, a lot of our local products, as well as on the desktop and mobile. Um, and so we're looking at a lot of things in that geographic area. But similarly, we're also, I'm starting to do some explorations in what I would call contextual discovery. And that's the idea of can we take location and a user's context and basically figure out what piece of information they need. Uh, and so it's kind of search without search, without you saying anything through voice search or typing anything, can we figure out, oh, well, you, know, you haven't been to this place in Paris before, and you, know, you were just doing this, so we'll give you information about this place, when it was built, what's important about it, et cetera. Uh, and if you walk past it every day, we'll give you the news, something like that. So we're starting to play around with some new concepts and how to find information. Okay, that's called contextual discovery. Contextual it's, discovery. It's not productized yet, right? It's something it's not. you're thinking So about. we've got a couple of things that we're experimenting with, but, you'll, yep. but the, I anticipate they'll be out sometime in the next year. So search was such an important job because most of the revenue of the company went through it. Why, why give that up and do something different? What, what was, why, you know? Sure. Well, I had done search for 11 years, and uh, I'd, we had seen the site grow from about 400,000 searches the first day that I started. And now we don't tell, say exactly how many searches, uh, but you know, it's the number one site on the web. It's the number one search engine. Uh, and you know, I would ultimately seen a lot of different innovations over that time. Uh, and I felt like this was a good time to try something new. And what's nice is that local location, local contextual discovery is all very related uh, to search. Uh, so a lot of my background and experience transfers. But it's something new to try. And we're organizing it more like a business unit. So it's engineering and product management together. Uh, and uh, we'll see how it goes. You didn't have engineering before in search. That's right. And how many people report to you now? Uh, I think it's you know, somewhere between 800 and 1,000, and then we also have a large group. I mean, it's really amazing. We're trying to build basically a, a virtual mirror of the world at all times. So we've got street view cars driving and planes flying and really trying to build all these different pieces. And if you count those people in, it's a few, it's a few thousand. So it's a very big organization. Uh, you know, this is one of Google's big investments, and we think in order to do a good job with information, with search, uh, with a lot of these important pieces of the platform, we really need to, to make a big investment here. Street View is one of your products. That's right. Did you see the German guy that was naked in the trunk of his car? Uh, I what just, was that all about? <laughs> like, uh, I think we've discovered that it was actually a, a hoax. So that it, it was, was it, yeah, it, was, it wasn't real. So oh, was, yeah. Was, you guys have all seen that, right? It was a German guy, right? Naked in the boot of his car? No? Oh, it's awesome. I, perplexing. It, I guess hoax, I don't know. That's kind of boring. <laughs> All right, so uh, this contextual discovery, you talked about it briefly, but I, I, I'd love to dive into this a little more. So just tell me again. The idea is you look at your latitude data, your, where you've been, and things that, you know, maybe that you've went to based on where you were, and then you're going to push think, useful think information it, to people or change right. search results based on that. Uh, no, I think it's the idea is to push information okay. to people. So think How? of it as lo location and Wh context. So one mm -hmm. way of thinking about contextual discovery would be to say, OK, inside the browser or with a toolbar, can we look at where people have been going on the web? Uh, and be given a certain page, given a certain browsing pattern, yep. can we make really good recommendations to you, tell you what in entities are interesting, give you more information about them, you know, basically complement your how web you, browsing how experience? Do you deliver it? How do you deliver the information? Uh, that's one of the big UI challenges. So we've yeah. actually been looking at what is the right user experience there. Maybe it could be a text message, maybe, or, or is it a... No, I mean, I think if it's in the browser, it would be something like a panel, maybe on the right or maybe on the bottom. 
that basically pulls up information that complements your browsing. All right, I get it. Okay. And then, and then if you're talking about like on a mobile phone, you're doing the same thing, not based on where you go on the web, but you're looking at where are you in the physical world, what were you just doing, and, and when you are using Google products and you give us your permission, we can ultimately figure out potentially what the next most useful piece of information is. So if you're sitting in a restaurant, can we pull up the menu? And can we pull up a menu that maybe isn't the menu that the waiter would have just handed you, but is maybe a social menu where you can see what other people have ordered, what other people like, how, it, how has it been marked yeah. up? If you're in an airport, you get the airport guide. I think there's a lot that can be done um, with using both explicit and implicit location information as well as user context. So uh, Latitude is one of your products. Yep. Mm -hmm. uh, can we just agree it's pretty terrible? <laughs> you didn't build it. You inherited it, right? So. Um, I, I did inherit it. I do think I actually do use it. Um, and <laughs> I noticed you're a very avid Foursquare user. It seems I do like you only use I, one. I do use Foursquare. Um, That'd be like you using Bing as your search engine, right? <laughs> no, I, mean, I do. You know, we we want to be familiar with our com our competition's products um, from time to time. But I actually think Latitude is useful. I just think it's useful for a smaller subset of people because it has an <laughs> always-on capability. There's probably you know a few hundred people you're comfortable with seeing your check-ins. There's probably only a handful of people who you want to know where you are at all times and actually feel more comfortable uh, because of that. So I, I assume we'll, we'll see some changes to latitude or <laughs> additional layers built on top? I think that that's right. I think um, that, that there'll be new layers coming on top of it. Uh, we'd like to ultimately get there. And I think that, that latitude becomes more useful the more people are who are on it. Uh, yeah. But I also think that if you allow people to do things like both implicit and explicit expressions of location, it okay. becomes a lot more comfortable. You, for them. you mean check check ins, a check in layer. Essentially, yeah. And you've encouraged people to build a check. -in. You being Google have encouraged people to build a layer, but it just hasn't really happened yet, right? To do uh, check ins. Well, I think that the, it depends. We we have a few places where it would be natural to put check ins. Yeah. Uh, and so we're looking at where we want to wire those in. So one of the lo lo logical places is latitude. Google Maps for mobile is also probably another logical place. Uh, we noticed you accidentally launched Latitude on the iPhone. Is there any, any announcement you want to make there? Is it coming? You, then you pulled it. Is it coming now? Or? Uh, we, we have always been interested in getting Latitude onto the iPhone, and, and I think we're close. Every year you give me one or two, like you know, one or two things, right? Like you just that one was a full block, right? You didn't like. We've always been interested in. <laughs> In the iPhone, so. so. But I think it's, it's I think it's clear that we you know Latitude is a network product, so the more people who are on the network, the better it works. So we want to make that network larger. So we've always been interested in getting Latitude on the iPhone, and it looks like we're close. So. There, so there are there are three big acquisitions that Ru Google is rumored to have been involved in in the last twelve months, that at least two of them fall squarely in your world, and and they failed to close all three. Um, Yelp a year ago. Twitter, at least a couple times over the last year, it seems. I, I, it's unclear to me how formal that was. And then Groupon, you must have been directly involved in those discussions. It would have fallen immediately under you. I'm not asking you to confirm that it happened. I think everybody sort of knows what happened. But why is Google, let's say that, let's just assume that they happened, these discussions happened. <laughs> why is it so hard for Google suddenly to, to acquire like these companies? It, Seven hundred million dollars, five, six billion dollars. Like, what's? It seems like they'd be jumping at the chance. Is that is all the luster gone? No, I mean I think that. Well, first of all, I have to say that I can't comment right. uh, particularly on any of these instances. It is important to recognize that every deal is in fact different, and it's also the case that the larger the company, in many cases, often the more complicated the deal is. How do you integrate that particular company? Uh, do you integrate it? Uh, so for example, uh, in the case of Slide, we've left them as an autonomous unit inside of, of Google. Uh, so they essentially are their own company. They have their own brand. They have their own you know, HR, PR, uh, all of that. Um, and so what the actual strategy should be is dependent on the company, the leadership, uh, as well as how it complements our overall products. And so I think that you know, in each of these cases, um, when you're talking about a large acquisition, be it ITA, which we did in June, so we have done an ad mob, you know, both of those are very sizable acquisitions. Um, we've really you know, had to had a very customized approach in each of those cases. Okay. <laughs> <clears throat> 
what, what is Hot Pot? You launched it on November 15th. This is one of your, your products, right? That's this is right. a Yelp killer? Is that, is this? No. no. <laughs> yeah. um, but what Hot Pot is, is it's a personalized recommendations engine. So this is a way, it's, we've done this sort of a small, a small rollout. It's built into uh, GMM, uh, Google Maps for mobile. Uh, and it's also built into places and our local search uh, on the web. So if you go to a restaurant, you can go ahead and rate it. Uh, we also have an interface that lets you rate lots of restaurants really, really quickly. Uh, and then, based on different connections you form, because you can tell us who your friends are, or just based on other users who are like you, even if you, you know, don't have any, any friends yet on the system, we will try and produce good personalized recommendations for you. So, sort of like, you know, it's like the Amazon case of who, people who bought this book uh, would also buy this book. We're doing the same thing. People who like this restaurant also like that restaurant. So, it's a healthy dose of collaborative filtering combined with a social component. Uh, and it's aimed of, at, at it's aimed at local businesses. You remember Buzz? There was something. No, I mean like it's, I'm not. I didn't mean that the way it sounded. But like, mm. yeah, there's this. There was this <laughs> part of it for rating things. It was was it part of places or what was it? There's so many brands now. I'm getting confused. Even though I, for a living, keep track of them. But there was a way to rate stuff. Is this like a new way to do it? Is it different? I don't remember the way to rate stuff in Buzz, but this is the this is the new way to do it, and this is the new way to do it, especially for local. And you go into Maps, into the Maps app on your. That's phone. right. So you can go onto Maps. You can also go into our Places search. So if you uh, on the left hand side yeah. of the screen cl click on Places, you'll see uh, the recommendations there. So it'll tell you, you know, three of your friends yeah. rated this a four star restaurant, or you rated this. So all those ratings uh, show up there, and then you can also. Uh, do the ratings uh, and see them on, on Google Maps for mobile. Okay, so so Google Social, the plus one stuff, is all that. Uh, can you confirm it? I mean, uh, Eric Eric basically confirmed it as a layer at, at Zeitgeist earlier this year. So I assume you're going to go ahead and say, yeah, it's real. well. I think that it's it's clear that social is very important to Google and that we're working hard on it. But this is something that we really feel that we need to do well and something that we think can complement a lot of our products. How important is it if you mess up again? No, no, I'm sorry. I, I, I'm not asking this like in a way, I, again. Uh, if, if it turns into another misfire, uh, in the I guess I just said exactly the same thing, but if you think of Orcut and sort of where it could have gone, I'll move on now. What happens? Like, is it, it, it mean, do you just turn into Microsoft sort of nursing a long term revenue stream of advertising while you watch Facebook rise? Or do you have another shot, another shot? Or is this do or die? Is what I, th I think that it's clear that it's really important. Uh, so we really want to get it right this time. That said, you know, if we don't, we're, we're patient. I think that when you look at the web, you know, there's really four key platforms. There's search, there's video, there's social, and there's mobile. And I would really argue that Google has gotten three out of the four of those really, really right. Um, and you know we're really working hard on, on the fourth one, and so this is something we're very committed to, and I, you know we will do a good job with it. How does Twitter Twitter is sort of a random card, like a joker? Like how does this play into the ecosystem, it, assuming they stay independent? I think that uh, Twitter is just an amazing distribution mechanism. It's also a very interesting way to consume information, but at least for us, it's a way for people to really blast out there what their activities have been. So, you know, for example, one of the things that we're looking at for Hot Pot is to really get, uh, you know, more awareness of it, more virality in it. Is it something where you can, you know, go ahead and say, okay, I just rated the restaurants this. I think when you look at Foursquare, which has obviously been really successful, I think that their presence on Twitter and people constantly seeing, I just checked in here, I just checked in there, really, you know, raised people's awareness, got a lot more people involved in the platform. So I think that that's really the beauty of Twitter. I think it's a great product. I use it myself all the time. Yep, but I think do. in the the core of in the core of, of social uh, for us, it's really a way to increase awareness of, of a lot of our efforts that have a social component. Should we expect uh, some acquisitions to come out of your group in the next six months? Uh, you I mean, I will say that I think you know absolutely. There's been a you know just a lot of acquisition activity at Google this year. I mean, I think you probably have been keeping the count better than we have, uh, but you know overall we I think are on track for almost an acquisition a week 
Yeah, but uh, not the little ones, like big strategic stuff like Groupon. I mean, will we? Are yeah. you aiming at some things? And now? I think that I mean, you see, you know, we usually do, you know, one, two, three of these each year. You know, yeah. AdMob uh, has, you know, been a huge success for us. Our mobile yeah. traffic is up by a factor of four. Uh, they've doubled since the time that they came in. We're now serving, um, you know, I think more than a billion mobile ads a day, uh, is the stat we released earlier this week. Uh, so, you know, that's been growing really quickly. Uh, we have uh, ITA, our travel uh, data acquisition, in the, in the works still. So there's usually a few large strategic deals at any given time. So, Sorry, my phone just buzzed. Have you seen this new phone I have? Is this? I have, and... Uh, it's the new Windows 7 phone. No, it's the <laughs> new... Uh, do, have you, it's the Nexus... Uh, it's the Nexus S. I have Nexus one. Two? And, uh, and I also actually have an engineer with me who would like to do a demo on one if, we, if you'd like oh, well, to allow us. So. That's so amazing, right, when I pulled that out. that you were <laughs> gonna, uh, And you said you're going to give one away to everyone in the audience. Is it? Unfortunately, not yet. <laughs> you have um, at least one or two to give away, right? I mean, that's such a crowd. <laughs> I, do, I do have one or two to give away. So maybe you know, we'll, we'll figure out a way to give the one or two that we have with us. Why don't I bring up Dave Burke? Dave is an engineering director in our London office. Uh, and for many of you, you've probably heard that we released our gingerbread operating system earlier this week, which is the next instance, uh, the next update of the Android operating system, uh, as well as a new pure Google experience, which is the Nexus, uh, the Nexus S. Welcome, Dave. Thank you. <coughs> hey, Michael. Hey, Marissa. Okay, so I have the brand new Nexus S that you've just heard about. This is a phone that we've been working on with Samsung for the last uh, 12 months, really. Uh, and it's the lead device for Gingerbread, the very first device with Gingerbread, which is Android 2.3. Uh, and it's our fastest version of Android yet. Um, and the Nexus S, it's, it's a pure Google experience device. Um, it's designed to give you the best of Google. So you get the very latest Android releases, the very latest Android features, and the very latest Android apps. And so one of the key parts of Android is Google Maps for mobile. Uh, and now with Gingerbread, we are bringing out Google Maps for mobile 5.0. And we have 100 million uh, users that are active using Google Maps for mobile. And we're really excited to look at this next generation of the product. And there's two key features in the new Google Maps for mobile. Uh, the first is dynamic map drawing. And the second is offline reliability. And those are the two features that Dave and I are going to show you today. So let's go ahead and jump into an example. Let's go ahead and use New York City. OK, so let's see. Uh, I'll try and search for maybe uh, Chelsea Market, which I've already got here. Um, and then we get a search result. Now, uh, by the way, I'm not on Wi-Fi. Um, so I'm actually on the cell network just for extra effect. That's not by choice. Um, so what you can see here is that if I pinch and zoom, you'll see a very smooth scaling of the map and very smooth scaling of the labels uh, because we're dynamically rendering the tiles on the phone. Um, and it gives you a much smoother experience, much more fluid, feels much nicer. And one of the really cool features on this is that if I use a multi-touch gesture to basically drag the map like this, I then get a 3D perspective. Um, and I can make another gesture like this to twist the map around and basically orient it into the perspective that I want to see. And so what we're doing is we're doing something that we refer to as vector maps. So instead of downloading tiles that are part of, of the map that you're seeing, we're actually downloading vector-based information, which means we can actually smoothly pan and zoom without having loading. So you, know, you probably have had the experience of sitting there on Maps for Mobile, and there's a gray spot on your screen. You're waiting for it to load. It's the piece that you need. It hasn't come down. What we're doing now we actually allows us to load this up front. So let's go ahead and take a look at a specific building. Let's try the Empire State. OK, I'm feeling brave, so I'm going to try speech recognition. Let's see how this works out. Empire State Building. So now what's happening is we're streaming the audio to our servers, to our data centers. It does speech recognition analysis, returns the results. So a lot faster than typing. Um, so my, my favorite feature of this version of Maps is the fact that it's got 3D building support. So we actually have building information, geometric building information for over 100 cities worldwide. So as I zoom in on the Empire State Building, what will happen is the buildings, not just the Empire State Building, but all the buildings around it will animate into position like so. And then again, if I do the gesture that I did earlier to pan the map to a 3D perspective, you can now see the Empire State Building all its glory. This is just the Maps app? 
This, this is, is the Maps awesome. app on Android. This is, the, this, <laughs> this is the new hotness in Maps. So two more things I want to show you. So again, uh, if I use that twist gesture, I can now do a 3D tower. panorama <laughs> of <laughs> the Maps. <laughs> It works in Paris, but we don't have the 3D buildings yet in Paris. So. <laughs> um, oh, so it's a canned demo. Is no, it, it's no, only no, no. We actually have 100 okay. cities. Unfortunately, Paris is, is not, not one of the Not even the Eiffel buildings. Tower? I know. I, mean, I know. It's killing us, too. <laughs> it's, it's, it's on its way. I have, I have one more feature I really want to show you. So, um, so you mm. saw I was like panning around the Empire State Building here. So if we bring the phone back up, right? So I can orient it, find it the nicest perspective. But you don't have to do it manually, because this device has a magnetometer, a compass built in. So if I turn on compass mode, what will happen now is the device will animate uh, and turn, change the perspective depending on the way that I'm looking, like so. So this is a really cool feature when you come out of a subway and you're lost, and you're like, which way am I going? I, when you're done, I have a question. Okay. <laughs> sure. So that, that we're, we're actually finished with that, that part of the feature. So I mean, so this is the, the overall compass piece. But we should talk about the other feature, which is offline reliability. So because vector offline, maps. Offline what? Offline reliability. Okay. And so not offline Gmail, which would be <laughs> not offline Gmail, but uh -huh. offline reliability. So one of the cool things about vector maps is we're we're downloading in each case about one one hundredth as much data as we used to, which means we can actually do things like three D buildings, allow you to pan and zoom more smoothly, but also means we can store more information on the phone, which means that if you don't have a connection right then. Uh, you actually may be able to continue to use Google Maps because we'll have the information cached for you for the places you go frequently. So Dave, let's go ahead and do a demo okay, of so offline reliability. So I have two ways to go offline. I can either go into airplane mode or connect to Wi-Fi. So I'll actually connect to airplane mode. Um, so uh, now what you see is I have no connection. Um, <laughs> and I have uh, an airplane symbol here at the top. Um, and so uh, what you'll notice is that everything is still working exactly as before. Uh, and what's actually happened here is that we've intelligently prefetched the map information. And by intelligent, I basically mean that we've looked at the positions that you frequent most. For most people, that's like work and home. Um, and we've, we've pulled that data down on the client side. And so it means that when you start up the app, it's instantaneous, and the tiles are just immediately there. But also, if you have no network or flaky network, uh, they'll also appear for you. So like, for example, in your case, like you spend time in Seattle, in San Francisco, and now you're in Paris. So we would have the city maps for those cities already downloaded on your phone, especially in the okay. locations in those cities that you tend to be in. So I think it's pretty interesting when you think about, you know, we actually a lot, spend a lot of our time taking the infrastructure and getting ready for bigger and bigger data. I think one of the cool things that the maps for mobile team has done here is they've actually made their data smaller in the form of these vector maps, you can see just how powerful it is in terms of what it really allows with compass mode, with the 3D, uh, the 3D buildings, panning, zooming, and also being able to make w maps work even when you're offline. So, so can I s raise your hand if you have a, a mobile phone that and it isn't an Android phone right now, you know, iPhone, anything else. So leave your hand up if you would consider what you've seen today moving to this device from whatever you have now. So that might get you another five, you know, percent market share or something like that, based on this stuff. Uh, <laughs> no, I mean, I, which it's is great. <laughs> we haven't shown you the rest of the features, but we'll do that another time. Is there, is there's more. I mean, what I like about it are the new uh, wallpapers, uh, which are fun, and um, <laughs> and I really like the fact that it's unlocked, and I was able to put an orange sim in when I got here, and just kept going with Google Voice. So. Now there was, have you guys seen this video on YouTube where some blog uh, got a grill, like a fire charcoal grill, and put an iPhone, an Android phone, and a, I think a Blackberry device, or no, a Windows 7 device? You haven't seen this? I've not seen this. Uh, and then they timed uh, which one exploded first. And <laughs> the Android lost, it turned off first, and then it exploded first. I mean, is that something that you're concerned with? I mean, that. You know, well, I think the Android least. was the most intelligent device. You realized it had no hope, and it just shut down. <laughs> it said it's too hot and shut down. That's a good answer. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, I'm going to leave at this note because this is Marissa's interview. Wait, interviews. wait. Uh, you're only selling this for now in the US and the UK. Uh, does that mean, is there a way to buy one if you're, say, in, I don't know, France uh, to get one <laughs> somehow? Do you, can you buy it on Amazon? So, so, .fr or? so right now, uh, we're selling these on Carphone Warehouse in the UK and Best Buy in the US, and it's on pre order. Um, uh, so there's a limited number of devices before Christmas, but in January there'll be a lot more devices. 
in January? And you might start selling them in other countries at that point? Yeah, we, we like don't have France? anything to announce right now, but um, it's okay. pretty likely. And how many did you bring for the audience? Did you bring at least a couple? I, I brought two, but they're both for me. And I've got, I've got one I could pitch in. I have one, <laughs> which I'm going to keep. But if you have, if you, you know, do you, do you, is this awkward? We didn't talk about it beforehand, but could we have like one person win one right now? Would that be? It'd be pretty difficult, but we could do some kind of raffle yeah. maybe. I don't know. You could just say you'd mail it to the moon. <laughs> yeah. Uh, no? Okay. Be I didn't mean to put you on the spot. We'll give away an iPhone instead. Do you want to do that? <laughs> it's one phone. It's not as good, though. That could be I, think we, I think we could give away one phone. Can you think of a fair way to do it? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Who loves TechCrunch the most here? Raise your hand. <laughs> uh, I have no idea. Uh, <laughs> uh, that was. Oh, oh, win, win, right there. That, that's that's a, interesting. Yeah. So we have an offer for to hand in his iPhone in uh, exchange. Well, I for think it. I think it needs to be more than one. <laughs> I think you want to take someone who's willing to actually get rid of their. Yeah. yeah. So, so the fellow who, he, over here yeah. with the iPhone, you can see us afterwards, and we'll go ahead yeah. and give you an exercise. So, yeah. <laughs> I do. Uh, can we talk another minute? We have a few more sure, minutes. Sure, sure, yeah, yeah uh, we can, absolutely, yeah. You're not working on this stuff at all, right? This is just something you wanted to talk about. No, today. no, so yeah. actually I am. So Maps for Mobile is one of the products oh, that you're I'm working okay. on. Yeah. Uh, and I actually have been working with uh, Andy and the Android team to start learning about the apps layer on top of Android and what should we be building, because I think that's also a natural place for contextual discovery. Is navigation obviously one of your Navigation apps? is, yes. And th that is not available on the iPhone, right? It never has been. That, right? That's right. That's it, something that is, that's exclusive to the Android it's, platform. Yep. It's, to me, it's one of the key things. Um, um, is to be able to talk to the phone and then it talks back to you and, and uh, you just don't have that anything like that on the iPhone. But uh, it also, uh, this phone makes phone calls, which is really nice. M.G. Siegler <laughs> at TechCrunch, um, I remember asking him once, because he's a die-hard iPhone guy, and I said, like, does it bother you that you can't make telephone calls on your iPhone? And his response was, this phone does so many fun things, I don't need to make phone calls. <laughs> and he actually said he believed that. And so... Uh, he, you know, we're, uh, he's right over there. You said, MG, that your iPhone, though, is working pretty well here, right? That it, it, because as soon as it, you got off AT&T, right? Marissa, you told me at Disrupt that in Japan, yeah, your Yeah, actually, iPhone, in, in Japan, like, the iPhone works like a charm because yeah. it's soft bank, so. <laughs> so what's interesting about it, that to me is that you use an iPhone, not an Android phone. Yeah, so I actually have a bunch yeah. of different phones. So I've got the original Nexus, now I have the Nexus S, the, yeah. you know, the iPhone. For a while, I had a Droid Incredible. And so, you know, I've been doing, you know, a lot of you know, different different phones. <clears throat> okay, so uh, do you mind if we do like some what ifs sort of just for fun? Like, uh, <laughs> sure. like if you ran Yahoo, for example, what would you do? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> just theoretically, would you, would you uh, cut back, lay everyone off like they're doing? Would you try to expand in a certain area? I'm just curious. Uh, I mean, I think that if I were, were Yahoo, I think it's a, one, I think it's a difficult, I think it's a difficult job. Uh, but I do think that Carol's done a lot of very smart things. I think that the partnership on search was smart um, in many ways. You know, we would have liked the partnership to have been with us. Um, yeah. But, uh, but that, that was smart. But I also think that looking at other really interesting brands that are getting a lot of traction um, on the Internet, are you know, those are smart acquisitions for them to make to really help broaden out their, their base, yeah. broaden out their platform, and ultimately stay relevant. Okay. Um, if you had an opportunity, you know, you guys invested in Zynga, not, not Google Ventures, but Google proper in the summer. That was announced. We, it's like, you don't do the poker face. That's official. <laughs> uh, would you love to, like, do an investment in Twitter or Foursquare? I mean, just if, you know, I know Twitter's raising. You like both of those services. Is that something that you'd, you know, see Google doing, maybe? Uh, I mean, I think that it really, in each case, it may or may not make sense for Google to do a strategic investment. I think clearly because, you know, in, in the case of, of Zynga, you know, there, there is a big social component uh, yeah. there, and gaming is not something that we have a lot of expertise in, and so it made sense for us to, to make an investment there. Um, and so I think we'd have to take it on a case-by-case -case basis. You, I mean, you make these. You're part of the super operating committee at Google, <laughs> right? The, what's it called? 
uh, the OC. <laughs> it's supposed to. It's like a joke. It's based yeah. on the television uh, show. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but um, but yeah. No. So the the operating committee. When I was promoted in October, I became part of the operating committee, which is the top um, dozen or so um, people in the company. And it's you know, all I've, the old people at the company. <laughs> Aren't you the youngest person on the committee? Um, I guess, I guess that I am, but yeah. I think that for me, you know, there's a lot of accolades and accomplishments I've been really proud of uh, inside of Google, and certainly being part of the operating committee, which helps decide our overall strategic directions and really helps operate the company. Um, being included um, and being able to contribute as part of that has been really one of the things I've been really proud of. And you guys, you can sit around there and talk about things like, hey, should we invest in Twitter? Or should we buy Groupon? Uh, how do we destroy Facebook? Those kinds of things, right? You sort of talk about? <laughs> we think about our big strategic challenges and partnerships we could have and acquisitions we could make, it's true. <laughs> so. All right. Uh, anything else you'd like to say, announce, or do on stage today? Um, no, I mean, I think that you know, we've had a really exciting week. So you know, we launched the Nexus S and Gingerbread and GMM 5.0 that Dave is out here uh, demoing. It's going to be, it's uh, come pre-installed uh, on Gingerbread, but it'll also be an Android market next week. Uh, but we've also had some big news this week um, with uh, our Chrome event yesterday. We had a big Chrome event where they did some demos of Chrome OS and showed how fast it boots uh, and showed just sort of what the overall direction of the operating system is. They also announced that we have 120 million active users of Chrome, which I know you've always been a big fan of, of Google Chrome. So we've had, uh, so we've, there's been a lot, of, uh, a lot of excitement around Chrome and what's coming up next and where, what, the, what they've really achieved along the way, uh, as well as the, the Chrome uh, web store. So they have web apps now, and we had a, a nice event That's that really demoed. like extensions, right? I mean, isn't that just sort of a fancy name for, for browser extensions? It's, it's extensions, but you know, it's done in a little bit of a different way because they're done in large part in HTML5, and so they're actually hosted on the network as yeah. opposed to being client software. Uh, so in most cases. So. Chrome OS on the netbook. So like you guys had this Chrome OS netbook yesterday. I looked at it and I'm like, wow, I forgot all about netbooks. And like it's like exactly in time for no one to care, right? About netbooks. But the Android guys talk about tablets. Is that is that sort of the line you've drawn internally? Is that Chrome will not go to tablets or eventually it will it just might take a while or what? I think that we I think we haven't really decided yet. I think that we see a lot of promise in Chrome OS and that we're actually using looking at Chrome OS to be on notebooks. So you, know, you notice that we, you know, we aren't really thinking even as netbooks anymore and as much as, as we are notebooks. And that said, Andy, um, as part of his announcements on Monday, actually did a nice demonstration um, on a tablet, an early version of a tablet uh, that we have been uh, developing with Samsung. But, and so that's getting, Android. And that's Android. So right now there is a distinction where Android is aimed at the tablet uh, and and uh, Chrome OS is aimed at notebooks. Uh, but that said, I think that the form, form factor for either uh, operating system could, could work for the other. And so, for example, we've seen things like uh, Google TV is built on top of Android. And so they do work in really radically different form factors. And of course, both operating systems are, are open and, and we have a, a vibrant developer community helping on both. When will I be able to download a copy of Chrome OS onto my MacBook? Is that sort of mid next year, never? Uh, uh, I mean, I think it's hard, it's hard to overall say, and I'm not sure that, that that's something we would ultimately At the OC, you probably do. talk about a date. Uh, <laughs> um, but uh, you know, I, can't, I can't speculate. Someday. That's a plan, right? Um, possibly. To be able to download it, not just buy it. And, like, exactly. For things like your current laptop. To that's right. Put it, and the idea is it's very light, it's nice. And, and yeah, it's, I mean, the, yeah. the big thing about Chrome OS is it's just super fast. So we're looking for a near instantaneous boot up. We're looking for a near instantaneous, uh, you know, coming out of hibernation and having your network connection just work. So the moment, you, so if you, have, if you had your laptop closed, you can pop it open and just start typing, and you're already on the web. Are you running? Really focused on that. Do you run it in the office? Do you have a computer with Chrome OS running on it? Uh, no, but apparently I got an email from Sundar and Linus last night that mine is waiting for me when I get back to Mountain View. So awesome. I will have one of the the early notebooks to test on Friday. Hmm. All right. Well, thank you. Thank you so much. Yes. And uh, everybody, big hand for Marissa.